Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Please keep in mind we've been looking at the birth of our Lord. First we started by looking at the birth of our Lord and the account of that birth given in the book of Matthew. Now we're looking at our the birth of the Lord as recorded in the book of Luke. We broke the book of Luke into four different parts, or at least the account of Christ's birth into four different parts. We're on part number three now this morning, so we'll be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In my blog, if you would like a written copy of this lesson, you'll find the lesson entitled, The Christmas Story from the Book of Luke, part number three. Okay, that's the lesson for this morning. In Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 through 20. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Okay. Please keep in mind, first of all, who is Caesar Augustus? He was the ruler of the Roman Empire. So Caesar Augustus decided he was going to tax everybody. Before he could levy the tax, he had to have a census of the different people and where they lived. Okay? So basically what you have is a census or a registration that's going to take place that would then allow Caesar Augustus to tax the citizens of Israel. So he demands that this registration would take place so everybody would register to be taxed. Verse 3, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city, okay? The best way that they knew of to register these people was to have them go back to their ancestor's town. By having everybody go back to the town of their ancestor, that would be a logical, systematic way of finding out who was living in the land of Israel and getting them registered for this tax. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth. Remember, Nazareth is where Mary was living. Nazareth is where Joseph was living. Mary now is pregnant. Joseph has to leave Nazareth because he's got to go back to Bethlehem to be registered for this this census that's going to end up in taxation for the people. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into the Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Remember, Joseph was a descendant of King David. King David was born in Bethlehem. And so Bethlehem was the town that Joseph had to return to because Bethlehem was the town of his ancestors. So Joseph leaves Nazareth with his wife. And they travel back to Bethlehem to take part in this registration or this census that would end up in them being taxed. Uh, Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Okay. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. So you can imagine how hard this must have been. They had just made this long trip. Long being because it was on the back of a donkey probably is normally how they would travel. The poor people would travel on donkeys. So probably this trip had been made by donkey. You can imagine how tired they would have been to travel from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem. They finally make the journey. While they're there at Bethlehem now, the time comes to pass that Mary is to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son. Of course, we know this is the Lord Jesus Christ. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes. That was just strips of cloth they would wrap around the baby. Back then, that's how they wrapped the baby up. It was almost like a, uh, it's kind of like a mummy type of thing or like a papoose thing that Indians would do where they wrapped the baby in bands of cloth. That's what swaddling clothes were. Just these bands of cloth wrapped around the baby. Laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, now again, you have to remember, for this census, everybody who was a male descendant of David who was living, who was a head of the household, they all had to travel back with their families to Bethlehem. 
So you can imagine, here you have Bethlehem's a small town. It's almost more like a small village. And you now have this influx of all these people who were male descendants of King David who were heads of household. So you can imagine how many people there were with their families. So there was no room for them in the inn. The inn was packed because of all these people that had come back for the census. Okay, there was no room for them in the inn, so they find themselves <clears throat> in a manger. <clears throat> uh, a, a, it was like a small building where the animals would bed down and be fed in. Okay? <clears throat> so we find Mary giving birth to Christ in this manger. Okay, now verse number 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Okay, here you have the shepherds now in the fields. It's nighttime. Okay, now let me just insert something very quickly, not to confuse the issue, but back in those days, shepherds could only have their sheep in the fields at night during spring, summer, and fall. It was too cold for them to be out at night in the wintertime. So when it says that the shepherds were in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night, that helps us to understand that probably the birth of Christ didn't take place in December at all. It was earlier in the year. Probably sometime in the spring, summer, or most people feel like probably the fall of the year. But the, one of the points I just wanted you to see very quickly was actually December was not when Christ was born. It's probably more like, well, the latest they could be out in the fields at night is probably the end of September, 1st of October. So it was probably sometime around then or before that the Christ child was born. Now watch what happened. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Okay, now keep in mind, we've had an angel visiting several different characters during this account of Christ's birth. You have them visiting Joseph to tell him about uh, Mary's pregnancy. You have an angel visiting Joseph later on then to tell him to go to Egypt. You have an angel directing him to go to Nazareth. You have an angel talking to Mary about her upcoming pregnancy here in Luke. The angel that told Mary about her pregnancy was given the name Gabriel. Now again, you can't know for sure, but it's possible. This angel that's talking to the shepherds is the very same angel. Here he's just described as the angel of the Lord. So I'm just saying that's a possibility. It's possible that the Lord sent the same angel each time. Normally he's described as the angel of the Lord, but when he was talking to Mary, he was given the name Gabriel. Could be they're different angels. I really don't know. I'm just saying it's possible this was all the same angel that the Lord used over and over again to deliver a message about his son's birth. An angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so greatly afraid. You can imagine these shepherds, what this must have done to them. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings, of good news, of great joy, which shall be to all people, Israel, Israelite and Gentile both. Would be, this would be a joyous, vacation, uh, joyous occasion for both Israelites and Gentiles. Why? Christ would be the Savior of both Israelites and Gentiles. When Christ came and when he died on the cross for the sins of his people, he died for both Israelites and for Gentiles. This was a joyous time for all people to think that the Messiah has come to the earth. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Right there we have it. Why is he a Savior? Because he delivers us from our sins. He saves us from our sins. He gives us freedom from our sins. And the punishment of our sins. That Savior is described as Christ. That word Christ is simply the Greek word for the Old Testament word Messiah. The word Messiah or the word Christ means the anointed one from God. In other words, the one that God sent on a very specific mission. He was separated from everyone else because he was going to perform a special mission for God. That's the idea of being anointed. So that's the Christ or the Messiah. Who is the Christ, the Messiah? The Lord. In other words, the one with authority over all things. So Jesus here, the baby, is described as a Savior because he died on the cross for our sins. He's described as the Christ because he's the one that God anointed to do a very special ministry on the earth. 
and he's described as the Lord because he has authority over all things. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, a bunch of angels now, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What a wonderful scene that must have been for the angels to see. Verse number 15, So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. What happens? After the angels receive the message, or I'm sorry, after the shepherds receive the, the angels' message, they step out by faith and decide they're going to travel to Bethlehem. Now again, you've got to remember, they got sheep in the field. This is no small thing for them. For them to choose to make the trip to Bethlehem when they had sheep in the field, it was a big deal. They would have to move the sheep as they traveled. They would have to continually be moving these sheep until they got to Bethlehem. But by faith, because they believed the angel's message, they were willing to do just that. So we can see faith in the life of Joseph, we can see faith in the life of Mary, and now we see faith in the life of the shepherds being willing to put themselves out, if I can use that phrase, for the sake of believing God's word and trusting God. We should be the same. Like we've talked about before, we should be willing to take a step of faith and do what God asks us to do, even sometimes when it seems like such a difficult thing to do. He goes on in verse 16. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this Christ. Once they saw Christ, what was the very next thing they did? They began to tell people about Christ. Folks, isn't that what we should be like? Once we come to meet Christ, once we come to Christ for salvation, in other words, where we now have a close, intimate relation with Christ, what's the next thing we're supposed to do? Tell other people about him. Local churches have that commission to take the gospel to the world, but also every saved person has that responsibility as well. If the Lord has saved us from our sins, we need to tell other people about the wonderful things that the Lord has done for us. That's what we see these shepherds doing. And all those who heard it, verse 18, marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. You know, they were totally amazed and astounded at what the shepherds were telling them. <clears throat> Think about it. The shepherds started with the angels visit they told them about. Then all the angels coming and <clears throat> praising God. And then they make the trip to Bethlehem and sure enough, everything was true that they were told. Can you imagine most people that hear that story would think, man, these guys, they're off their rockers. <clears throat> so they were amazed at what they heard. Listen to this, 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. When she heard the account of what the angels' experiences had been, she wasn't amazed at this point. She knew all these miracles the Lord had performed up to this point. Elizabeth was pregnant when she was thought of as barren. Mary now was pregnant after not having relations with a man. So it didn't surprise her near as much as other people when the shepherds told her what had taken place in their experience. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Real quick, do you notice how when the shepherds shared the news about Christ to others, they not only told them what they had seen, but also what they had heard. Isn't that the two parts to any Christian's testimony? It's what we've heard with our ears, in other words, what the Word of God has said to us about Christ, but it's also about our own personal experience with Christ we share with others. We say, look, this is what I know about my Lord because the Bible says so. It says that he came and died on the cross for my sins. And you know, my life has changed. See, that's sharing with people both what we have heard and what we have seen. That's what the shepherds shared with those around them as they told them about the Christ. Thank you again for spending time with me as we study God's word together. May the Lord bless you.